Hi guys and welcome to Quick Guides for Medicine. Short videos designed to help you get your mind around things to learn in internal medicine. My name is Fatai and I'm a third, current third year resident in internal medicine at Brookdale University Hospital Medical Center. So, for all of our videos, like I said in the previous one, there's three questions I want you to ask yourself at the end of it. Three things for every diagnosis. How does it present? and what risk factors. Two, how do you test for the disease? Three, how do you treat the disease? At the end of every video, if you're trying to remind yourself of the things that are most important, that is how I want you to think about it. And that's how I'm going to go through the videos. Today, we're talking about acute coronary syndromes. I'm going to divide this video into two parts, all right? The first part will focus on how the disease presents and how we test for it. And the second part, we're going to focus on um, the, the treatment. So without saying too much, let's get right into it. Just um, an, an important note here, please enlarge the, we can watch the video in full screen to make sure the annotations are seen um, clearly. Okay, let's get right to it. Um, three diagnoses here, unstable, angina, all right, and STEMI, and STEMI, the big one. For this video in particular, we're gonna talk about only unstable angina and, um, uh, and, and STEMI. Uh, so let's get right to it. So remember what I said in the beginning, for every one of those diagnoses, you have to ask yourself those three important things. But just to, before we get to that, just to re recap on some of the important things from from previously, remember what used to look like this in your, some of your basic science courses, like an artery this way. So let's assume that it's coronary artery and this is the atherosclerotic plaque here. And then we have a rupture of that plaque and then we have a thrombus formation somewhere. And then that thrombus formation is what leads to the occlusion of the vessel. All right, and depending, we're assuming that is the blood flow struggling to get through there. And depending on the severity of the occlusion, that is what gives you the particular diagnosis um, within the coronary artery disease spectrum. So let's assume here, this is the cardiac tissue. Uh, and if it's significant enough uh, um, uh, occlusion, there will be cardiac infarction and then eventually uh, cell infarction and then eventually you have troponin coming out. The presence of troponin obviously will further help us to categorize the, uh, the to get to the specific diagnosis. So let's get right to it here. So first thing you remember we said, how does the disease present? We're saying here, typical chest pain. When we say typical here, we're referring to pain that is typical of coronary artery disease. Um, remember, it's substernal. It could be radiating or maybe not. Um, you know, the things that aggravate it, the things that relieve it, uh, you know, associated symptoms and all of that. But several things are important to make sure to emphasize uh, to help us be clear that it's actually pain as a result of coronary artery uh, disease. One thing here is is the pain reproducible for typical chest pain? It should be non reproducible. All right. Second thing does the pain move, uh, change with movement? All right. For typical chest pain, it should be, it should be that it does not change. All right. With movement. So that's, those two things are very important to know. So having said that, um, typical chest pain, you know, substance and all of that, it's non-reproducible, does not change with breathing movement, probably more suggestive of um, um, pain associated with uh, coronary artery disease or acute coronary syndromes in this particular case. So let's go further to the next thing. How do we test for the disease? What's the first thing you do when you have a patient coming in with such pain? Obviously, you get your 12 lead EKG, all right, 12 lead EKG, and what are you supposed to find in the 12 lead EKG? Uh, in certain cases, it might be non-specific STT changes. In other cases, it, you might actually have ST segment depressions 
or T wave inversions, T wave inversions. All right. Um, so th those are some of the things you find in EKG. What other tests are you supposed to do? You go ahead and get your cardiac enzymes. Um, which one are we more concerned about? Troponin, obviously. Troponin. Um, a point of note here: if the patient has told you that they're having, you know, they've been having the chest pain for the past twenty-four hours, for example, remember troponin will typically come out in the first, you know, uh, uh, four hours or so after the pain started. So you should expect troponin to be up. So that's just something to help you, you know be clear by your diagnosis in the beginning. But anyways, back to this now. You check your cardiac enzyme in the patient that's having typical chest pain to, you know, possible outcomes. It could be negative. It could be positive, all right? In this case, if it's negative, you're making a diagnosis or an assessment of unstable angina. If it is positive, you make an assessment of an STEMI, all right? Um... It's also important to note that this pain here is not related to, to does not is not relieved by rest. Because if it is relieved by rest, then you're going back to more more like a, a, a chronic situation of uh, stable angina. Um, but anyways, back to this. EKG cardiac enzymes. So this is how we test. These are the most important initial testings. What are some of the other things you might do, you know, later on that would that will help in the total assessment of this disease? You may also want to get a transthoracic echocardiography. In fact, uh, some of the earliest changes in acute coronary syndrome is actually seen on the echo with the wall motion abnormality. So it was important that, you know, most centers have the capability to do this at bedside on initial evaluation uh, to be able to further, further, you know, nail the diagnosis. All right. So here you probably would see wall motion abnormalities. All right. The next, you may also want to add as to, to the bunch of labs that you're doing at that time, you may also want to add your lipid panel, all right, and your hemoglobin A1C because these guys definitely help you um, uh, to, to assess for modifiable risk factors that you can, you can take care of, all right? So these are some of the initial testing for... Um, for unstable angina and uh, end STEMI. So once you have your diagnosis, we'll talk about treatment in the next video, all right? We'll talk about treatment. Treatment is, you know, a couple of things. But let's say you have your diagnosis, right? It's also important to, just for, for the fun of it, unstable angina is also referred to as ACS, without infarction just to further help you um, um, understand the mechanism behind it and the, the features of the disease itself so we said if you have a positive ACS diagnosis uh, whether it's unstable angina or NSTEM you treat obviously treatment will typically last for about 48 hours all right so what do you do after treatment? You further have to you, you have to do further testing to f you know specifically nail the diagnosis because at this point, up until this point, it's just it's just based on some of the non non specific uh, findings. So what do you do after about forty eight hours of treatment or within the period of the treatment itself? Um, you do a risk stratification. It's important that you do this. Um, risk stratification and the encounter itself, all right? So as they're coming in, as you're making your diagnosis, do risk stratification. And what does this risk stratification tell you? I'm using our color to make it clearer. Um, the risk stratification is based on a series of uh, information according to the TME scoring system. And TME is, the, the, used to be, it was used back in the days for to see what patients should get thrombolytics or not. Um, and he has, I don't emphasize, I don't, 
advise to really memorize everything in the in the team is scoring, but most importantly, know how it is used because most people have phones that can you know do the calculation there. But what are the questions that the team uh, will be asking? Uh, number one, the age. Obviously, if they're more than 65, that is significant. Uh, more than three risk factors for acute coronary syndrome, hyperlipidemia, hyper, uh, hypertension, uh, diabetes will also be involved. Known coronary artery disease of about 50% stenosis, that is significant. Um, uh, EKG changes from baseline, STT changes of base, from baseline of up to about 0.5 millimeters. Um, use of aspirin before that particular encounter. Um, uh, uh, troponin. Uh, presence of cardiac enzymes. So when you put all of those inf all of that information together, there's two possible, probably three possible outcomes. You can have a low risk, which would be the scoring will be zero to two. This is considered low risk, all right, low risk. Or you can have an intermediate risk, which is three to about five, or a high risk, which will be about five to seven. Let's just say three to seven would be intermediate or high risk okay for the low risk what you're supposed to do for them is a pre-discharge stress testing if that is remarkable depending on whatever we'll talk about different types of stress tests in another video but if the stress testing is remarkable you do coronary angiography that's basically your cardiac catheterization all right and here, for intermediate or high-risk patients, you go straight and do your coronary angiography. Please note that this cardiac catheterization that we're talking about here should be done at least within the first 24 hours. You don't, you don't wait for your treatment to be completed before you do the cardiac catheterization. If you think that they're high-risk, you definitely go into cardiac catheterization straight away. But there's the, also some patients, right? There's also some patients that, as they're coming in, you can almost say immediate or urgent catheterization for these group of patients. For example, if there's hemodynamic, let me use another pen there, sorry guys. If there's hemodynamic instability, they definitely should get a cath like ASAP. If there is heart failure, all right, they should definitely get a cath. If there is sustained VTAC, all right, they definitely should get a cath. Um, I think also if the pain does not go away, if pain does doesn't go away, they should definitely get a cath or if they're having some form of worsening or new murmur, they should definitely get a cath immediately. But if we're not dealing with this situations here, we'll go based on whatever we already have here. We have a diagnosis, we'll start treatment, but you know, as we're doing the treatment, we do risk stratification and based on that, we do other pre-discharge stress testing that might eventually lead to coronary angiography or go straight to coronary angiography. So that's it for the testing. On the next video, we'll talk about treatment. If you have any specific questions about anything we've discussed, please you know, put your questions down in the comment section below. You can email me, residencecove at gmail.com. Um, I'll do my best to respond in a timely manner. I'll see you in the next video. Thank you, guys.